Hello and welcome to Culture Over Coffee, a podcast focused on improving company culture and fostering employee engagement. Every week we chat with experts and thought leaders about the latest information and proven practices you can use to reduce regrettable turnover, increase productivity on your team, and retain key customers. So pour a cup of your favorite brew and join us. I'm your host, Beth Sunshine, SVP at Up Your Culture and the Center for Sales Strategy. In this episode, we're continuing our exploration of each of the four engagement elevators. Today, we're going up in elevator number two, people development. This elevator drives managers to demonstrate that they care about their people, build individualized relationships, transparently share information, coach both strengths and weaknesses, and provide meaningful feedback. And one of the best people developers I know is Fran Malice, president and CEO at Make-A-Wish Arizona. Fran brings tons of great points to think about, including the importance of creating a culture that celebrates risk rather than punishing failure, how we often make the mistake of assuming our employees know that they're doing a great job, and why diversity of thought can go a long way in creating a strong company culture. So Fran, thank you so much for joining me today for Culture Over Coffee. I had the pleasure of working with you, gosh, for a lot of years now. Yes. You were a client. Um, Now you're not. Even now, though, we've made time to connect, to talk about talent, ways to develop people, ways to increase employee engagement. Recently, we talked about team building. I know people have always been a passion of yours, so I'm really glad that you've agreed to be here today to chat, talk a little bit about people. Of course. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Anytime. I'm grateful. Anytime I get to see you and talk to you. So Ah, this is fantastic. So really appreciative of you taking the time with me. Love that. Well, this will be good. So you're familiar with the four engagement elevators that we use to help organizations lift culture, elevate engagement. And that's really what this whole season of this podcast has been dedicated to. We've been exploring each of the elevators for our listeners. We've been um, going through them one at a time. And today we're going to focus on people development. I know your passion for your employees has always been one of the things I've most enjoyed about working with you. I think it's just a hallmark of of yours. And I know it's as strong now at Make-A-Wish as it has ever been. Um, So I'm really excited to get your perspective on all of this today. Are you ready to jump in? Sure. Let's do it. Okay. So I want to start with a really broad question, not yet about the engagement elevators, just about culture and engagement. I just want to know why do you think that it's important for any company to focus on these things? Why does employee engagement matter or what benefits can a company see if they do focus on employee yeah. engagement? So it's everything, right? So um, as you know, from kind of uh, hearing me for many, many years, um, having a people focused culture is where it all starts. And truly, you can't do anything else with it. So the team drives everything. So if that's not your foundation, you're not going to have as successful of an organization as you can. What I love about coming from the media industry and now coming into the nonprofit space, it's absolutely transferable because people are people, right? So we can't deliver now on our mission before it was delivering on our, you know, our ad budgets and things like that. Although there is a a revenue budget associated with number of wishes and things like that, that needs to happen. Um, But you have to provide that infrastructure You also have to give people the opportunity to meet them where they are and you need to get them their resources and the tools. And you also need to let them be empowered to make mistakes. And that's how they'll be able to really learn. Um, And I think they also need to know that you have their back to support them. So in terms of making sure that they know that we want diverse perspectives, we want their opinions, we want their voices heard, that's really key. Uh, And I think a lot of times we forget that those are just basic things and needs that people need in general. And what I'm also realizing, it's it's really interesting with our coming from the media industry into the nonprofit, it's a much different generational mix. So I would say the average age of our team is like 33, as opposed to in media where it's, you know, quite a bit older, there's just different things that really motivate them and inspire them. 
and it does need to be about what's important to them. And I think that bringing out the best in each other, and you've heard this for many years, that's kind of the mantra, yeah. you know, that we've really lived by for so long and bringing that into creating and fostering a positive environment where yeah. that is the essence of everything we do. That goes into the community. It goes to our wish kids. It goes to their families, our board, because um, it's so different in terms of the structure of where we are today. But that also helps build confidence. And I think that's a really important thing, especially with the generational type things that are happening and that whole team sport. Everyone has to be working toward that same one team, one mission, which is mm -hmm. where the mantra kind of transforms into bringing out the best in each other. But I think also creating flexibility, um, this space of gratitude in the nonprofit space, when you're working with Bush kids, you're bringing joy and happiness. You know, we say joy is happy um, and happy is, you know, really important. And that's what we bring every day. So it's hard not to be focused on our people because that's what we're focused on in the everyday work that we do. Uh, and we also focus on self-care. You know, it's a big deal to make sure that there's balance you know, just like the media industry, when you're working a lot of hours, we're working a lot of events, we're working a lot of wish granting and things like that. You've got to give people time to recharge and refresh. And one of the fun things that we um, decided to do for December is that we're letting everyone work wherever they want to work remotely. Ah. And we're only asking everyone to be in one day a week. Oh, um, wow. And that's just for the month of December? Yeah. So if they want to go visit their families or they want to have time to do that around the holidays, we want to make sure we provide that environment for them mm -hmm. because we really do believe that's going to make a difference for them. And it's also going to make a difference in the lives of the people that they've entrusted to be able to serve. So we think it's a pretty big deal. Very big deal. Interesting to hear you talk about how so much of this is transferable from your past life in media, dealing with ad budgets and all of that to the nonprofit space. So much of it is the same and yet there are differences. And um, one of the things you pointed to is just generational differences that might come up again in our conversation. I want to yeah. dig into people development. And sure. I think you said people are people like we need to remember just the human side of, of what we do every day, but also interesting to think about the differences of people. So I'm excited to hear yeah. sort of how you break that down. Um, one thing I think you and I probably both agree on is the fact that the commitment for people development really has to start or come from the very, very top. The mantra you pointed to is a great example of that. It can't just live in on any one team or with any one manager. It has, it has to come from the top. So what are some ways you can think of that companies can foster that kind of atmosphere where they're focused on their people and the development and growth of their people? Well, you have to make sure you really are intentional about it. So you can't just say it. You actually have to have the actions that prove it, that you're doing all these things. Um, and I'll give you just a couple of examples that have at least worked. And I've only been here just, just short of a year. Um, we've instituted IDPs, which are the individual development plans, yep. just so you can show, particularly with um, a different generational type, they want to know how they can tie back into the community. They're the things that they are really, that are really important to them. I mean, they've picked nonprofit for a reason because it's so important to them. They picked Make-A-Wish because the mission's important to them, mm -hmm. but it's got to be a way to tie back to everything that they're doing. Um, and having an IDP allows them to see where they can grow. And again, one of the things that other companies can do that we just did in the last few months, we created a path, kind of a journey for them. Mm -hmm. So we've said, gosh, if what's important to you? You know, if a title is important to you, what are those responsibilities that come with it? And it's not so much the title as it is the responsibilities, mm -hmm. but building the level and different levels and showing them what they need to do or what they need in terms of what's next for them and get, get looking at the possibilities for them and what that might look like. Cross training. Um, we've gotten, you know, we started a book club, you know, we've started economic forecasts because we have people that don't even know that they can actually contribute more to a 401k and why should they be doing that and what's it going to be compounded. So bringing and introducing things like that, that aren't your traditional growth opportunities with, you know, things like just training and that kind of thing, or going to industry events, uh, we join the chamber. So not only does the chamber have events and mentorship, which I think is key, every single one of our employees now has a mentor. 
and they have to have a formal mentor. They may have had informal mentors, but they have to set a lot, you know, side time to do that and through the chamber. And then they've, um, they've got a mentorship program and a mentee program. So we're tying them so that they don't necessarily have someone that's they're being mentored by, by their boss inside our own organization. It's expanding the possibilities for them with very corporate type businesses. And there's a young professionals group that now meets and has mixers and they have speakers. Um, they just had one because the Super Bowl is going to be here. Their chief marketing person spoke about what they're going to be doing, you know, to bring even more people into Arizona soon yeah. you know, for the Super Bowl. But it's just things like that. Or we just started a DEI council and they're driving that. So it's all coming from the grassroots of our employees saying, gosh, this is important to us. Why are we not doing these things? And now we're starting to develop and do things like that. But those are important. And we have a huddle every week. And every single person is assigned to a huddle. And they can do whatever they want with it. They have an hour to talk about whatever they'd like to talk about. And we've had things like um, people coming in and talking about how to use photography in the digital space. It happens to be our digital digital manager. So, But that was so valuable you know, for everyone to learn when we're on a wish and how do you take mm-hmm. pictures and what's the best lighting and like even things like that, that are growth opportunities that aren't your, you know, typical, I'm going to train you or I'm going to cross train you on how this job is done or how this job is done. So I think it's opening up wow. that opportunity for people to, to do things like that. Yeah, people don't grow in a vacuum. We tend to grow in relation to someone else. And I I love the way with the chamber mentor-mentee program, or you mentioned the IDP, or even planning out the the career journey with someone, all of those things, investing that time in someone. It's exciting to hear about it. I want to kind of add a launching pad. You mentioned the IDP, and it, it really caught my attention. It was called an individualized Development. 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 Yep. I want to I want to dig into that yeah. individualized you need part. Both. Say so you, need both. you need both. You need an individual plan for yourself because yep. you know what's unique about you like a giraffe. Yeah, um, I think of the giraffe in there to be able to stick in. I'm glad I wouldn't be a conversation with yeah. you if you did not. You might even need to elaborate on the giraffe. <laughs> but yeah, we'll see if we have time. Um, but it's really important because there's certain things that there's going to be gaps in all of us, right, on what we need to know or what we need to learn for that next thing that we want to mm-hmm. do. But then the things like digital photography or um, we had eight people from our team that spoke at the national conference. They were excited and nervous about it, right? One of the things that I'm finding with this team, they don't like getting up and speaking in front of people other than the team itself. So just being able to say, hey, have you done Toastmasters or, you know, what's going to make you more comfortable? Because you're great when you just start talking about all that knowledge that you have uh, and repositioning their mindset that they're actually giving a gift to someone when they're sharing with them their experiences. And just rephrasing that. So they learn a lot of the more um, general things in our huddles or when we have our board members come in and talk about what they do for a living. But then the individual piece is, I want to be able to be a better public speaker or, you know, I want to uh, learn Excel. I mean, Mm -hmm. simple little things that we forget about that maybe along the way they didn't learn how to do PowerPoint or they didn't learn how to do some type of graphics package or whatever it might be. And just giving them that confidence that they can take those classes, um, particularly when they're online and Make-A-Wish America offers an amazing university that allows for that, you know, as a federated model, we get all of those resources available to us and they can do it on their own time too. And then they can work with their, you know, their leader to make sure that they get the things done when they need to get them done. So when you're developing someone, how much of that development do you think is um, sort of for everyone and how much of that needs to be really customized or individualized to the unique human being because of their you know, unique talents or skills or experiences? What's the balance there? I would say it's probably 60-40. So I think 60 60 being more individualized because there's things that they want to do. And a lot of times it may be things that they already possess and they just don't know that they have it. And it's, again, bringing the best out in them. But I still think there's that 40% that's going to be generic Mm -hmm. that they're going to learn or more generalized. Because I think as we think about positions for the future, they're not as specific as they used to be. They're definitely more generalist than ever before, at least in the nonprofit space, 
because the cross training is really fun to watch because everyone is coming together as a team. And I think it's tough if you have people just doing their job, you're always going to create those silos if everyone only has one thing that they do really well, where if they're more of a generalist, then they can learn things about other stuff when people are out or they may actually say, wow, I actually like this more than my thing that I'm doing today. I think I want to explore more about that and then gain more knowledge because of it. So I think it's opening up those, again, possibilities and opportunities that they may have thought that they might not even like because they didn't get an opportunity to be exposed to it. I love it. So a big part is probably asking people where they want to grow, where Correct. where they feel like they haven't had exposure. Love it. Yeah, they want to tell you. So the best thing that we can do as leaders is actually ask yeah. them, right? Mm -hmm. so, you know, that to me is the advice because you've got to ask people what it is they need and want. Us yeah. trying to second guess or us trying to make those decisions for them doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work with anything that we do in life, right? Because we're making assumptions when we don't really know unless we talk to them. I agree. Yeah, I think you're right. Asking the questions, where do you want to grow? How can I help you grow? Certainly key. A big part of growing someone is also giving them feedback along the way. Yeah. And one of the questions we included in the Engage 2022 survey was about this. It was about giving feedback as just part of the people development strategy. So I want to tell you what we learned, and then I want to get your reaction to that. So I've got it written right here on my screen. So while nearly half of the respondents that we heard from said that they have received feedback from their manager within the last week, 21% of them have not received feedback for yeah. at least six months and 15, yep, 15% 15 of them have not received feedback from their manager in the last year. So first, I just want to hear, what is your overall reaction to that? So number one, surprised. And I would say, not okay. Right. That is not okay. So right. I think, again, as leaders, right, of organizations, we have got to be better at that. So we have to be intentional. And I will share with you that for, and this is something, you know, we did at Cox that, you know, was a great learning practice uh, that I brought over. We do listening tours. So mm -hmm. I meet with every single employee twice a year. So definitely easier to wow. do with less than 40 employees, right? Because you can pull it off for an yeah. hour. Um, but it's really important. And those are the times where you ask, you know, what makes you tick? What ticks you off? You know, what is it that's, what matters to you? Why, you know, why are you here? Why do you get up in the morning? Not mm -hmm. your traditional, hey, what's your biggest challenge or what's your biggest opportunity? They get that in their one-on-ones. So what yeah. surprises me the most is that our team does one-on-ones. Some of them do them weekly, depending on what department you're in. Um, with wish managers and things like that, we're doing so many wishes a day that you kind of have to meet, you know, more often. But I would say there's not one person in our building that doesn't have a touch point with their leader at least once a month. So that's why it shocks back me. in that on yes. their performance or on correct whatever. Yep. So why do you think that is such an important part of developing people specifically feedback? Yeah. So I think it's two parts. And I think there's the part where you have to tell people what they're doing well and yeah. you need to encourage them and help build their confidence so that they more do more of that. Mm -hmm. And I know you're a big believer in strength finders and I am. you know Gallup and all that, you got to make sure that you're honing in those skills that you do really well. The other part of that is you've got to, you know, we say it's a gift, right? Feedback's a gift. You have to let people know when they're stubbing their toe. Like it's okay, you know, to be, you make a mistake. What did you learn from it, right? Celebrate that you actually made a mistake and you took a risk and create that culture and environment that allows it to be a safe place. If you don't do that, you're not going to have people growing. They're going to just get stuck. And I think yeah. if you don't, again, if you don't tell people what that is, they can't do anything about it. So you've got to have that balance of making sure that they know exactly, you know, what's occurred. And a lot of times they probably know anyway, and it's not, you know, berating them. It's actually saying, all right, you know, what happened? You know, what yeah. are you going to do different next time? Or, you know, if you could, if you had a do over, what would you do differently? So that's I a think great way to say it. If you had a do over, what would you yeah, do? Differently? What would you do differently? Yeah. Right. So everybody gets a pass. Everybody gets, you know, no one's perfect. And I, I think like that's that. that culture thing. It's you can't be afraid to say, I made a mistake. And 
Again, right. I think that starts with me. I have made tons of <laughs> mistakes along the way here, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in a new environment and I'm learning every day. Being yep. vulnerable is so important because when you show everyone it's okay to do that, I'm seeing more and more people go, okay, I messed up. Here's what happened. And you kind of laugh about it, right? Yes. What's the worst thing that could happen? I mean, what on earth could we do? We're not going to hopefully do something that's going to be detrimental, right? If we make a mistake, we learn from it yeah. and we say, okay, here's how we would fix it next time. Yeah. And we'll make sure that we don't do it again. But you've like got to create that culture. Yes. And I like that you touched on both sides of it. Um, you started by talking about the importance of telling people what they're doing well. And it's funny to me how often we don't do that. We assume people know what they're doing well. If they're doing a good job, we assume they know they're doing a good job. But what I've found over the course of my career, and it sounds like this has been sort of a hot button for you too, is people don't always know. Um, when they're highly talented, when things come naturally to them, they're not always able to put their finger on exactly yeah. what it is they're doing that is leading to success. So having a manager point that out, it's kind of like in sports where the coach might play game film after the game and yeah. be able to point out real specifically, see that right there, that is what. Well, and I like what you said well. about that, Beth, but do it in the moment. Like in when the someone moment. does something really yes. great, do it in the moment, I right? Or if that. something happens where, you know, for us, we might be with a wish family and maybe something didn't go great. When you get back in the car and say, hey, you know, maybe it could have worked even better if perhaps this would have hurt or something like that. Yes, I you love know? that. So I just I think that. in the moment is important. Don't wait, you know, yeah. whether it's good or, you know, encouragement in terms of that, you know, feedback in terms, you know, you're not criticizing them, but you're giving them something constructive that they mm -hmm. can walk away and go, oh, OK, I didn't even realize yeah. I did that. And how many times have you heard that? You know, I mean, how many times have I said, wow, I had no idea that I even did that. So I think yep. it's really critical that I you do agree. both. Um, but you got to let people know when they're doing a great job, too. Everyone so wants best, that. Best practices that you're saying, I guess, would be, first of all, make sure to point out what they're doing right. Also, let them know when they stub their toe. And and I like yeah. the phrasing of, you know, if you had it to do differently, what would a do yeah. over? What would that be? Give them that feedback in the moment. In the moment. Um, good, really I think good. the communication is so big, right? We forget sometimes, and we used to laugh about it at Cox. We're called Cox Communications. You know, sometimes we just forget they're like that communication part's really important. <laughs> right. You know, and yeah, even with we, like even with wish kids, like, well, did we tell them that they needed to be whatever, whatever? Oh, maybe right. not. You know, but we, assume, have to. we assume they knew. Yeah. Well, because everybody gets so busy and you've got so many things on your plate that you yeah. kind of have to take a step back and go, OK, what is it that I actually just said to someone? And did they really walk away, you know, okay. understanding it? And I, I like to do that in one on ones, too. And of course, reviews. You know, what did you hear? You know, tell me oh, what I you like heard that. just to validate, because sometimes people don't even walk away with hearing that they do an amazing job. Because sometimes something may have happened in their past and they can't get through or get over something that was said to them 10 years ago. But if you make right. them say it, well, this is what I heard. Um, and, it, and they don't come back and say, this is what I heard. You can say, well, let me tell you what I said. I think you heard it a little bit differently. So let's talk about that again. I like that. It's the yeah. three sides to every story, right? There's yes. what I said, what you said, and what we each <laughs> think happened. Right. And I like that asking, what did you hear? So yeah. maybe this would relate to that, or maybe you have an entirely different train of thought for this next question, but is there anything you'd recommend that managers specifically do to avoid stifling employee development, to avoid doing it wrong? What Anything that, that they you would recommend they steer clear of? Yeah, I would say not allowing for people to make mistakes, not allowing for um, complacency, uh, just making sure that you ha have this continuous learning environment mm -hmm. and then don't micromanage, you know, you've hired someone to take on a role because you felt like they were the very best person for it. Get out of the way. Yes. So I think a lot of times we get in the way or we don't give that extra freedom for people to make mistakes or, you know, do things a different way than you thought it could have been done. That's been a great learning for me is 
it may not necessarily be the way I would have approached it, but wow, that really worked. So yeah. I just think getting out of the way is probably the best advice. And again, hire the right people, hire the people around you and surround yourself. I mean, we always used to joke, hire people that are smarter than you. It's different yeah. now to hire people that really bring different things um, and don't hire someone just like yourself because it's not going to help you with, you know, growth for the organization and all those kind of things. So don't be afraid, you know, don't be afraid to hire someone that's really very different from you and make sure you've got diversity of thought. I think we do get stuff that we like people that are just like us and we have to break that mold to, to not do that. Um, I think that's really important. So those are the things for me, but the micromanaging, I mean, I've seen it everywhere. It, it stifles everything. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't make you feel good about, you know, what you're doing. And that's where you build that trust. You, you know, you build that trust because you let people do what they need to do to get the job done. And you know what? A lot of the times they do it even better. Yeah. Than the way that's... that you thought that they could do it. So I, I like the don't tell, ask, um, and make sure you're asking your team what it is they need right? Mm -hmm. Or ask them, you know, what they think and make sure all the voices are heard. I think a lot of times we also go to the same people for the same projects, or we think of someone, think of different people to do things and give other people a chance. Um, and I know that I've learned that being here because I don't know everyone and I don't know their skill sets yet. I'm starting to do that, but I just pick random people to do things. And then you see what happens because I don't have that built in um, jadedness, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, and it hurts the people that you go to all the time. You know, it yeah. creates kind of a little bit of animosity that they are, you know, reviewed as, or viewed as, you know, someone that is really close to you, or, um, it might be a favorite, that type of thing. I think it takes all of that out of the mix. If you go to different people and give, um, everyone a chance to do different things. Mm -hmm. And even the ones that don't raise their hand, because the ones the you know, the usual ones raise their hand all the time or volunteer. I'm interested in the ones that don't. Why are they not volunteering? Why are they not raising the hand, you know, their hand? Mm -hmm. So giving people. And then once they do, again, they build that confidence. And then you've got everyone that wants to do everything, which is really kind of fun. And it makes it very fair and equitable. A lot of what you're talking about from creating diversity of thought to not micromanaging, not getting in their way. Yeah. A lot of it, even going back to where we started our conversation with the IDPs, really relies on building trust. I'm yeah. hearing the, the theme of trust sort of running through everything you're saying. Your people have to trust you and you have to trust your people in order for you to develop them. Right. And, and, and values, them. right? What are the values of the organization? You know, create the values that are important to the team. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, I know we have even Make-A-Wish America values, which are great, but we have different ones for the Arizona chapter, right? Because there's yeah. different ones that are important to us that are really, you know, really, really important to us yeah. um, that we're working on every day. I'm so glad you added that. We are out of time, but boy, I oh. could do this all day with you. I want to thank Me too. You. Thank I don't like being out of time. time. Oh, I love no, our time doing. together. We'll do it again. And we'll talk oh. offline because I do love talking about just people and engagement and growing, um, you know, our organizations and our people. So thank you for, for making this time, having some culture of her coffee with me. You've shared oh, a lot of information. You have a, a lot of unique perspectives. You had some very unique ideas that I think our listeners will walk away with. Um, for those listening, I'm going to drop Fran's LinkedIn information in the show notes so you can connect with her, keep up with all the great things she's doing with her team at Make-A-Wish. You can also ask her about the giraffe because we didn't have time to get and to that one. today. Don't Keep asking people uh, if they had a magic wand, what would they wish for? That's a really good question. There's another good question. Yep. So start those conversations with Fran. I'm also going to drop in the link to the Engage 2022 report. I referred to that earlier. There's some interesting statistics in there. So you may want to dive into any additional details there that might interest you. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Fran. Enjoy uh, the you. journey of your culture. Appreciate being here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for spending time with us on Culture Over Coffee. If you've enjoyed the conversation, be sure to subscribe and join us for every episode. For more helpful information on the topics of company culture and employee engagement, visit us at upyourculture.com. Enjoy the journey as you increase engagement and up your culture.